This episode of the BJJ Attic Podcast is being brought to you by Submission Fight Company. Visit Submission Fight Company on the web at www.submissionfc.com. It is also being brought to you by MMA Mount. MMA Mount is your source for the latest MMA news, interviews, photos, and more. Visit MMA Mount on the web at mmamount.com. What's going on, everybody? We are live, the first ever BJJ Attic Podcast. I'm your host, Real DWC. I'm also here with my main man, Jonathan Cheris. Say hi. Hello, hello. We are training partners, and uh, he might be my BFF. <laughs> so let's get into it. First of all, BJJ Attic on Facebook. Go find us, like our page, uh, help us out, support. If you are a fan, check out our YouTube. Uh, BJJ TV, subscribe, uh, watch some videos. You can follow me on Twitter at Real, capital D W C, also at the BJJ Addict. My friend here, John, doesn't believe in Twitter, so you, <laughs> you can't even follow him, guys. I'm not a fan of Twitter. Let's get right into it. Let's talk about some of the subs that happened uh, over the weekend, uh, or UFC. one in one in particular, UFC on Fox. Uh, main event, Nate Diaz, Jim Miller. Yeah, uh, thought it was an awesome fight. I mean, a lot of times with guys like that, you don't uh, two black belts, you don't see them go to the ground just because of a, out of a mutual respect for for each other's skills. So it was really nice to see uh, to see a little world class jujitsu in an MMA match and uh, to see the finish. So. Do you, you find that happens uh, too many times? Like two black belts, you're like all pumped up, you're ready to see jujitsu because you're such a fan. And then it becomes a boxing match. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's well, I don't know, percentage-wise, but I would say a good 60 70% of the time, that's what happens. So it's nice to, like I said, uh, I mean, for jiu-jitsu uh, fans, it sucks. But for everybody else, people like to see stand and bang, right? So I'm sure you don't get that much of a f- feedback from it. I, I agree, totally. And uh, so we caught him in a, a deep, uh, a little like, guillotine to me. Right. And... Uh, he was biting his tongue. Jim Jim Miller was biting his tongue. That's they what zoomed it, in that's on what after. Like, yeah. And there's blood. And uh, do you think this even played a factor, or was the choke that deep? Listen, I've been, I've been. This has happened to me once before. Yeah. Uh, by you, I believe. I was. Yeah. Was. I had my tongue stuck, and it adds so much another level of pain that you're just not used to in jujitsu at all. Yeah. In anything, really, you shouldn't be used to biting your tongue. Yeah. Uh, um, but yeah, it adds a whole other factor of pain. So I can't speak for for Jim Miller, but yeah. for myself, yeah, it it definitely adds to the, to the pain of the choke. Yeah. So yeah, definitely. I mean, or even forget about the choke and start worrying about your tongue. So let's go back a bit. You, you you see the announcement of this fight. I myself, I look at the fight. I see both black belts. Nate just got it from uh, uh, Caesar Gracie. Right. Right. And uh, I looked at it. I said, this is going to a decision. There's no way one of these guys are going to finish it. They're both tough guys. No one's getting knocked out. Right. No one's getting subbed. Did you see that? I mean, like I said, I'll go back to what I said earlier is that I don't, I wouldn't, I didn't expect it to go to the ground. Yeah. So I expected it to stay standing. In that respect, I thought Diaz would pick apart Jim Miller a little more. Jim Miller with maybe a little more power. Um, but I'd still like, I'd still say with you a little decision, but I would, yeah. I would see it going Nate's way. All right. Also on the card. There was Alan Belcher versus... I Paul Harris. I'm just going to go ahead and say it. It's Paul Harris. I, I like his name, Paul Harris. Uh, his alter ego, perhaps. Right. Um, barely pronounce your name. I'm not going to go try to I see this. this fight. Alan Belcher, a black belt, but I've never seen... He's so good at tie. I've never seen his, his ground skills uh, that much. Also, I said, Paul Harris grabs his foot. Yeah. It's game over. Over. For anybody. We watched the ADCCs together. Yeah. We saw him rip people's legs clean off almost. Yep. It's it's scary. I'm talking about it. I'm just I'm shaking right yeah. now. Did you think Alan Belcher had a chance when it hit the ground? You let's know, just say. It. Yeah, okay, let's let's just talk about when it hit the ground. I mean it blows my mind to even you know, I I didn't think he had a chance, especially with the, when he's grabbing the legs. So yeah. I don't know how you would I mean, I, I don't know. You can't train for something like that. It has to be insane. 
instinctual. It has to be. So it just goes to show his level of jiu-jitsu is that much higher than everybody else anticipated because that's not something you can teach. Yeah. Uh, you can't train for Paul Harris's leg locks, clearly. Yeah. So just the fact that he was able to hold it off for a little bit just goes to show his level of, of jiu-jitsu. Speaking of levels, maybe also not even the level, but actually knowing something outside of the normal jiu-jitsu box, we saw him going for a, a banana split a twister. Um, do you think the fact that he knew some 10th planet stuff through like, did Paul Harris look kind of confused in like a deer in headlights? Like what is he doing right now? Yeah, that's, I don't know. I mean, I would assume it would be, it would be helpful, but like, then again, you're pushing into, into Paul Harris's world of leg lock. So uh, I think maybe Alan Belcher's MMA experience paid off a little more where he was able to know when to use his punches and when to come back to, I mean, um, that, that, Paul Harris is more used to a jiu-jitsu game, a gi game, whereas yeah. Alan Belcher knows when to throw those punches and when to go back to jiu-jitsu, when to trans transfer between the two. So maybe that helped. I, I can't say specifically. I agree. That's very nice. We'll move on a bit right now. We'll go to this upcoming weekend. we got a BJJ Expo, uh, an IBJJF tournament, uh, the World Jiu-Jitsu Expo, actually, in Long Beach, uh, Long Beach, California. And uh, this is this is the first time it's ever happened, by the way. Oh, okay. This is uh, an idea that when you think about it, it sounds like as if it's never happened, right? Right. This guy, I mean, I can't name everything about it, but it is humongous what's going on as far as free seminars, the tournament, uh, uh, like people selling stuff. It's a whole expo of everything to do with jujitsu, knowledge. Uh, An MMA expo. Yeah, it, it's, it's yeah. crazy. Everything you can picture for those expos but for jujitsu, yeah. So also, on top of all this, they have super fights. All right. So let me let me just let me just name some out here. Let's go right to the the main event of all main events when We're it comes down. down sure. Yeah. Nick Diaz, brother of Nate, fighting Barilio Estema. Yeah. Who do you who do you got here for a second? Uh, you know what. I'm going to have to go with uh, Estimo on this one. I mean, uh, like it's going to, I would assume it would be a great match. And I don't want to, I don't want to take Diaz out, but, uh, but I'm going to go, I'm going to go with Estima for this one because uh, just because of his, his knowledge and his experience in the sport, not taking anything away from Diaz, but um, I mean, I wouldn't pick Estima in an MMA match. I would pick, I would pick Diaz. So we'll talking about jujitsu. I'm going to pick Estima. That's I, I agree. I think totally, uh, without stepping on anyone's toes, just trying to be not biased. I think Estima has the slight advantage. Yeah. He's been at that high level. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I asked the people out on, on, on Twitter, on the BJJ addict, and, you know, it was honestly a good 18 to 2 yeah. out of every 20. Yeah. So, like, it not, it's everyone's counting yeah. Nick out. But Well, remember how many people counted Randy Couture out with, the, right. uh, with the fight against uh, Cobri? Uh, Yes, back. <laughs> this guy doesn't know what he's saying right now. <laughs> but uh, Randy yeah. Couture's been counted out many times. He always prevails. Yeah, the underdog role. Yeah, exactly. So he did really well in the jiu-jitsu world as well. All right, moving on. the The grudge match for for of all grudge matches right now, as far as BJJ goes, okay. we don't have the the craziest, uh, you know, kind of like a a background build story, up, a right, build right, up. Yeah. You, you don't have the media that the UFC can produce or other right, MMA right. companies, but you got Kyle Terra and Jeff Glover. Right. This is in uh, Nogi. In Nogi. In Nogi. So right off the bat, you got to think that makes a difference. It does. I. Yeah. Who do you see going down? Who do you see getting the W? You know what? I I'm I'm a little biased in this point because I'm a huge Jeff Glover fan. So, um, but I I even even if I wasn't, I'd have to say Nogi Jeff Glover. Just because, like, of Nogi. Yeah. Do you, Do you think the fact that he has uh, really shown his knowledge of deep path and obviously the Dars with his Darsopedia? Do Do you call it Dars in this one? Uh, it's hard to say. I mean, Cairo Terra is no no dummy. I mean, I'm sure he's going to look at all this and have a background and have a game plan. Like, uh, because Jiu Jitsu is becoming more evolved, these people are are more well known. You can you can have a game plan strategic to certain people. So, I mean. I'm not going to call the submission by any means uh, specific, but I, mean, I am going to go with Jeff Glover on this one. Nice. Uh, all right. Let me uh, name off a couple more. We, we're not going to break them down. The Kyra Gracie and Alexis Davis. 
uh, Kron Gracie versus Victor Estima, which is uh, Baralo's brother. Actually, yeah. I'd like to know what you think about that one. I would. That one right there. Dave's a big, uh, big fan of one of these guys. Oh man, the you know Ice Cream Kron. <laughs> uh, that's his nickname. For you don't know, he he uh, actually hasn't. Uh, lived up to what the hype was for him coming into becoming a black belt, let's say. But uh, Which is a lot of pressure. Yeah, it, it's it's too much pressure. But at the same time, you know, uh, Victor has to deal with the, the pressure of being uh, Baraglio's brother. Right. But he, he's proven uh, his level, as has Kron. I, I'm just saying uh, what others have said. This is not my thoughts. Right. Because the level I'm at, and the le- I think he's mind-blowing good. Right. But you hear people doing these talks, you know, the son of Hicks and... The, it's ridiculous. What do you, what do you want from them? Yeah, that's what I want to know. What yeah. do people want to sub everyone yeah. and, and be unbeatable? Imagine if he became a plumber. <laughs> yeah, like you know, he he's doing what he's uh, yeah. supposed to do. He, he's at a high level. For this fight, though, I'm actually I'm calling Victor. Just throwing it out there. You all could hate on me. Let me know. Actually, get on my Twitter. Let me know uh, as soon as possible if this is a bad call, guys. Uh, the more the merrier. Every, I like people getting in. I love uh, I love having discussions. I, I don't want to call how I'm just calling him on uh, just lately the performances I've seen lately. Yeah. Uh, also, we got uh, you know a veteran of uh, MMA. Also, uh, Nino Shambri. He's facing Bill the Grill Cooper. <laughs> uh, I know you like Bill Cooper. We both watch him sometimes and are just blown away by his movements. Yep. And uh, that's gonna be a tough fight. You call him Bill? Uh, I. You know what? I. I I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna make a decision on this one. It's too. Uh, yeah, I can't really say. I don't know yeah. enough about either of them jujitsu style wise. So yeah, it's hard to say. That's but a, I. I hope Bill wins. I mean, yeah. I, I'm a f- Bill fan, so. And the last fight, uh, Kyron Gracie. Uh, he just won his d- division at the Pans, I believe. I watched that, and uh, he's facing Rafael Lovato Jr., who uh, is a mind blowing fighter. And uh, that should be a good fight, too. I'm not calling any more of these fights, but uh, out of all of them that we named, definitely the Diaz Estima, just for the uh, you know the style clash and seeing how Nick yeah. does. And uh, the Terra Glover, a backdrop to uh, not even to do with BJJ, the, the trash talking. It gets you excited for things. I'm not saying I want trash talk in BJJ, but it's kind of nice to have that. You know, it's nice to have that. The fan base behind people so passionate, like, oh, he said this, he's gonna prove them wrong, yeah. and get that interest. The more people talking, I think, the better, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. That's so. Yeah, check out that uh, expo. I'm sure you can watch it online somewhere. I don't have the details, but if you look into it, guys, the BJJ Expo, you could uh, definitely find out more. Uh, I'm sure, we'll find it and put it up on BJJ Addict. Some more details. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know what, guys? I think we're ready to uh, bring in Lloyd Urban. And uh, talk to him. It might take a second, guys, so uh, bear with me. But uh, we're definitely ready to talk to Master Lloyd Urban, who is our guest today. If you guys... We hear the phone ringing. Hello? Hello, how are you? Very good, how you doing? I'm great. Thank you very much for taking time out and being on the first ever episode of BJJ Addicts Podcast. No problem. My pleasure. All right. Uh, I'm here with my co-host, uh, John. How you doing today? How you doing, Big John? Not bad, not bad. <laughs> How'd you know his nickname? Uh, I call everybody Big, big, big uh, part of his name. So, uh, do you mind if I call you Lloyd, Master Lloyd? What do you prefer? Doesn't matter to me. All right. So, Lloyd, uh, can we just jump into it? Do you mind? No, go ahead. All right. So I was going to ask you, since uh, you're the coach of uh, Brendan Vera, Dominic Cruz, I want to know, is jiu-jitsu and MMA even close to being a complete system yet, or is there still a lot of holes? And uh, has it reached its potential? Has it plateaued yet, or are we far behind? For, as far as jiu-jitsu is concerned? Inside MMA. Yeah, it's, it's like every, everything, there's not, there's not like one one broad answer to that because it's everything has to do with each individual and who's fighting 
and who, you know, depending on who's fighting, what their style is. You know, like sometimes you see guys that are getting a closed guard and they get pounded, and then the next, the, all the talking about a closed guard is dead. Then yeah. you see another guy in his closed guard and he's submitting people. Then it's oh, closed guard is alive. It, it wasn't. It wasn't never dead. It's just that the person. Some people can use it better than others. Some people can use it as a defensive position. Some people can use it as an offensive position. So it, it, it varies from person to person. All right. With that being said, did you happen to catch the the Belcher fight that happened on the weekend? I just watched Mike Chandler's fight because he was training with us, so I only got to see his fight. That was a great fight, by the way. Yeah, that's right. He did. Mike did a great in, job. In regards to that, I'm sure you know the outcome of the fight, uh, of the Alan Belcher fight. How would you um, send one of your guys in there, uh, no, going against such a such a well known leg lock guy? Would you? How do you train for something like that? How do you prep a guy? Well, conceptually, all you have to do is your entire camp based around leg lock defenses and fight and defending leg locks while being offensive striking. Allen did a great job um, immediately put him in the twister and immediately, you know, from that from that, ang- from that angle, you know, he shut down the leg lock attack. And like I said, he did an excellent job. He, he had his hidden when he needed to be hidden. He came up and he, he did much damage from the ground down. I, I loved it. Yeah, we were very impressed. Yeah. Uh, also, you're uh, in Las Vegas uh, being a coach on the Ultimate Fighter. How is that uh, being a coach to normal, everyday students that you see, but now having a whole group of fighters that uh, didn't know you as well, let's say, uh, how is that? It, it was fantastic. Um, it's a great working with the guys. Most of the guys had already known me from, you know, just being out, you know, as a martial artist. So they were excited to work with me. I was excited to work with them. They were open to... Um, you know, all my ideas. First thing I did, uh, I rolled with all of them just to see what, you know, from top and bottom, what they did, uh, what their strengths were, what their weaknesses were. And then instead of teaching them just open to jiu jitsu, I started adding things that could complement their game that over the period of the next 16 weeks could uh, to add to the game to help their overall game. And uh, I said, the guys really adapted to the transition, they really adapted to the techniques that I was showing them. But it, it, it was definitely different um, than working with the guys that we. I know passionately each and every day for years. Um, it was definitely a, a good challenge uh, and a great time. That's awesome. Uh, thank God for the, the social media. We could find things out a lot quick, quicker and uh, immediately. I saw some pictures and videos of you out at Robert Drysdale Gyms in Las Vegas. Uh, did you guys happen to go over maybe any uh, tips trading and uh, how to coach? And Did you guys get time to actually talk or was there not much time? Yeah, we we didn't talk too much about uh, coaching per se. Like we were, he was running a class at the school. We we were participated. He did share some um, some uh, a cage back take with me that was just phenomenal. I've come back and put that into the uh, my school system. Uh, I, I really fell in love with that. I saw him doing it to Alexander Gustafson when they were training. Um, other than that, like he was open. He wanted to get uh, have some time. We could sit down and talk. But like I said, uh, with all the camps running around, we just never got. Never got a chance to sit down, but like I said, over there was amazing. He's a great coach. Uh, had a lot of great guys that were popping in from all different camps. And it was a great time. Yeah. How how, how somebody uh, at your level, um, being a coach to so many, you're very successful and well-known in the world. Uh, how do you yourself, you said you did a class, uh, stay so open-minded that you actually see uh, Drysdale's move and, and you liked it so much you put in your, your curriculum is that something you have to teach yourself, or has that always been instilled uh, in you to be so open-minded? Well, it's something that I've always been open to everything. I, I believe, like I said, when I came up in jiu-jitsu, like my, my instructor left uh, when moved back to Brazil when I was only six months into my training. So I was basically left here by myself to learn, and that, that mindset of always being open, no matter if it's a, everyone has something to share. Like I said, when I was at Drysdale's, he was running a class. I sat aside. I watched. I paid attention. Uh, when I, when I, I always watch different things for different people. When I saw something I like, I go up and ask. You know, he showed me that. And like I said, everybody has something to offer. Yeah, I come from a mindset where it's not jiu-jitsu. I've learned judo. I've learned sambo. And a lot of jiu-jitsu guys uh, will see a sambo technique that looks exotic or difficult and say, oh, that will never work against a high-level person when it will. And those type of instructors that will say something like that, 
will limit the student from being able to ever experience uh, all the other different arts and styles of uh, martial art philosophy that are out there. I don't have that. I'm, I, if, if, if something can work on a white belt or blue belt, I'd rather explore possibilities and things that you can do to tweak it, make it work at the black belt level, than say, oh, that'll never work. I mean, uh, it will. That, that's amazing. Uh, so you would say it's, uh, it, it's, it, that really helps set you apart from others is, is that open-mindedness. And if to be a good coach, I mean, that would be one of the key qualities is that open-mindedness. Yeah. I mean, like, I can't say it just separate me. It's like all the coaches who are open-minded, that's definitely a plus. Like I have no problem. If I'm out of town, I'm at somebody's place and, uh, and they're teaching off the down in, in the group. Like I love being a student. Um, not just a coach. I like being a student. Very rarely do I ever get away. I can sit sit down in the group with the students and learn uh, and see different things. But like that, my mindset towards coaching and learning is like is much different. Like I, if I see a guy who's six foot six foot three, two twenty eight, and he has a specific body style to one of my students, I'll just watch him to see if he has anything unique that he does specifically that I can bring back to my student. Not only just not to my class, my student body, or my athlete, you know, right. even one specific person. I take notes. Um, I'm 42 years old. I still take notes every day. I took, uh. take kind of notes when I watch guys um, roll. It's, you know, there's, there's, there's so much stuff out there that people are doing that's just, you know, slick, little tiny things. If you look at the last fight with uh, Nate Diaz and uh, Jim Miller, yeah. just the way with yeah. Nate down, instead of Nate falling the back, he fell to the left side. Uh, so he can get his left hand deeper, one hand choke, hand yeah. on top of the tricep, other knees on top of the arm. Like, I take notes of that. And then when I get back, I play around with it. And it's cool. Like I said, we have our own variations of guillotines, but like I said, that's something we don't do. Uh, and it's something that we'll add in. Yeah. Wow. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, as far as you being a coach again, and uh, how do you keep your students hungry, motivated, mentally focused? Uh, you know, you got people out here winning – but how do you, you keep them to, listen, the main goal is the next tournament. And they win that. The main goal is, the, you know, you keep telling them the next one, you know, every time. So how do you keep them uh, staying fueled up, ready to go? Well, each year, depending on, like, when our cycle. So for the, the PJJ guys, the end, the end goal is always the Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu World Championships. And everything between, before the Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu World Championships are what we call our, you know, our work-through tournaments. And we have specific work through tournaments that we have to hit, like the uh, Europeans, the Pan Am, the Brazilian Nationals. Then you have the lower level work through tournaments, like the New York Open, Dallas Open, Houston Open, Miami Open, all these type of tournaments. And then you have the um, non IBJJF tournaments, such as Rappos Quest and Naga. And yeah. all these tournaments are all leading up to the Brazilian Jiu Jitsu World Championship. So um, each one, our job is to go out there, get experience, no matter if you win or lose, go out and do your best, don't quit. And make sure we learn something from every experience because when June comes each and every year and you're on the you're on that match for the world championship, there's only gonna be one person that's gonna be a real Brazilian Jiu Jitsu world champion at the end and that's the goal we're focused on. Everything else is leading up to that. So uh, there's not really you know, there's always motivation during after class when the guys are getting beat up or or if there's some injuries. But as far as uh, motivation, everything is about making sure everyone is laser focused on the goal of the Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu World Championships, understanding clearly that everything be between that is just work through tournaments, and we're trying to improve each and every day. And do you even use that snapshot for your lower level? Uh, let's say, um, uh, not like maybe the students who you don't expect to win uh, a world. Would you still use that snapshot as a, as their motivation, as their drive, or would you stick to lower level, uh, like you said, competitions? Well. It, it depends. Each each person, like when you sit down and see what your goal is. Say if, you, say if you're one of my athletes and your goal is to become a world champion. If that's a real goal, you assess that you have the ability to train like you know, like if it's a real realistic goal for yourself. Then we'll put the plan in place. It doesn't matter if you go. It doesn't matter if you win or lose. Because if you follow the system, you put the training time in. Uh, everything is a learning pro, uh, progression. You have some guys that will go to this last year's world champion, like Kenan Cornelius, last year. A world champion. He went. Uh, I think he lost like in his third round. A few other matches he lost first, second round, and now he's winning everything. Uh, it, it, it wasn't didn't have anything about him winning, but he wanted to win. But everyone has to go through their progression. Everyone has to go through their experience. And like I said, then when the what I call the grappling phenomenon hits, you have an explosion just like Kenan's having right now. 
That's nice. Can we can we talk about him actually for one second? Sure. How, how do you keep him uh, so grounded and uh, you know not get too crazy that uh, he's the best thing going right now? Because I watch him and he he's might the best be thing going right. He now. might be one of the best <laughs> out there right now as a, a purple ball for sure. How do you keep uh, Keenan grounded? Well, a lot of different factors. Like you know, he has he has phenomenal. Phenomenal parents, and his parents help. Uh, you know some of his, you know, his upbringing from his parents. Uh, in the class, in, the, in, our, in our our gym, we have a hierarchy and we have a specific culture. Um, so we have a lot of people that are world champions. We have a lot of people that are or national champions. A lot of people that Pan Am and European champions. But every day, all of them are all focused on the world championships. So like. Yeah. Uh, in their mind, they go, they go win the Pans, the Europeans, the Brazilian Nationals. But if you go fail in the World Championships, you're not a world champion, um, no matter how good everything else is. So, like I said, it comes back to the same thing. Uh, all Everything else are amazing, ph- fantastic, phenomenal results he's been getting, just like other, our other athletes have been getting. But at the same time, all of them want to be world champions. And, 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 and after June, World Championships, you know, there's only going to be only going to be one. So staying focused on that goal, um, that's a big one. Yeah. So we all know. Uh, I agree with what you're saying. By the way, we all know about uh, some of your past students that have had uh, humongous success. Uh, I mean, uh, all under your tutelage, uh, building the brand of Lloyd Irvin, uh, and you got some of the the newer guys like Keenan really driving the force home. Uh, JT Torres. Is there anyone else that uh, never got uh, their name out there and, and uh, the recognition you think they should have as a, an athlete, uh, say, before you really took off and blew up in the, the world of martial arts? Is there anyone else that kind of helped out that never, no one ever heard their name? I'm not sure if no one ever heard the name, but like I said, one name that uh, is not mentioned when there's talk about Team Lloyd Irvin greats as much as uh, one of my athletes, uh, Nigel Eason. She's the sister of uh, Mike the Hope. He's fighting in the UFC right now. Yes. Nigel was our actually our very first Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu World Championship. She's the first person on the team to go get a gold medal at the World Championship. Nigel wow. has won the Brazilian National Championship. Uh, she has won the European National Championship. She has won the Pan American Championship. She's won every. She's won, she's won Abu Dhabi. Oh. Gold medal to Abu Dhabi. She's done every single. She won every single major competition there is. But like I said, when you hear Team Lawyer the name, you always see people mention other people's names. And like like this, she is probably one of the most decorated athletes we have on our team. Do, do you find uh, women's uh, BJJ and also MMA is getting looked over too much? Not sure it's getting looked over. It's still about marketing and promotion because, like most of my most of my guys who are known worldwide, they're known worldwide not because they just won at the tournament. So they, you know, I I had an active role in marketing them, promoting them, like email list, putting videos out them of them. Uh, and my, my my email list and my email reach is a uh, you know worldwide. Two hundred two hundred plus thousand on the list. Uh, so I I have a very big. Uh, like this, uh, women BJJ is, is you know women's sports are overlooked most times. But like I said, they are phenomenal athletes. If you look at them, what they're doing pound for pound and technique for technique is it's phenomenal. But like I said, um, I, I want to make sure that all my athletes get the recognition they deserve. Uh, all of them work hard. Uh, like I said, we have a lot of people that aren't known now. We have a lot of people that don't even compete. They're phenomenal in them. Um, like I said, it's a time. Good culture here, and everyone is helping each other work towards that goal. And if anyone stands in the way of uh, um, limiting that, then you know we try to get rid of them, remove them from, from the process. So it's a process of doing what it does. I, I respect that. I think that's a, a wise decision. Also, that was some great tips you just also uh, uh, dropped in there for other coaches or teachers. I. Uh, I know you have your, uh, you know, your schools. Can you just talk about that so people know how they could come out and uh, maybe do one of your seminars? Yeah, I have a, a group called Mixed Martial Arts Millionaires dot com. Mixed Martial Arts Millionaires, and 
at a point, you know, I was successful in the martial arts. I was successful in the tournaments and grappling, and, you know, my guys were doing well. But the school was failing. I almost lost my school. I was three months behind my rent one time and almost, you know, got kicked out. And I, at that point, I made a decision to learn how to you know, run my business. I have, I have a world-famous saying that everyone knows that people are, people are repeating it, but I, this is my quote. Treat your business like a business, it'll pay you like a business. And if you treat your business like a hobby, it'll pay you like a hobby. And I was treating my business like a hobby. You know, I was focused on other things. I started learning what how to run a real business. And I basically pulled away from the school for a while and just focused on business development and, and, and Internet marketing and direct, direct response marketing, direct sales, sales processes, and sales systems. And I came back and put that into my school, and my school blew up. And then um, a few years later, everyone, you know, see my school, I see all these successful grapplers and, and fighters that have struggling with school. And they, they think that because they're winning world championships or they think that they're in the UFC that students are going to come in droves and sign up, and it's not the case. And when it's all said and done, I, I believe that Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, mixed martial arts, Muay Thai, like the best martial arts in the world. And I, I decided probably in 2010 to start teaching other school owners uh, how to put systems in place, how to use my systems, and teach them an overall mindset and, and, and um, real-world ability. Because when, it, when it's all said and done, at the end of the day, if you don't have a constant way to drive new prospects and leads into your school and a constant way to, to sell them into your program, like, you don't, you don't have anything. You have a, a, a hobby. And um, it's been phenomenal. We have, like, you know, a, a bunch of U.S. fighters. We have a lot of uh, high-level BJJ black belts. We have world champions. We have like you know, big-time people that come to the events, and it's good to see people really want to learn how to treat the business like a business. And that's what I'm here for. That, that's uh, that's an unbelievable uh, tool for uh, other martial arts school owners uh, to learn. And uh, you're talking about them uh, teaching your system, uh, your ideology, uh, I could say. And uh, you find with new students coming in off the street, never heard of Lloyd Irvin. Uh, never heard of the Gracies. Uh, is it harder for you to sell uh, your style to them opposed to someone coming in, traveling down to Maryland uh, to learn from you directly because of what you've already accomplished? No, not at all, because I have a system to indoctrinate a uh, new student that has never heard of me into what I've done, what we are doing, and who we are in, you know, in, this, in the martial arts space. So, like, when they first come in, we have audio CD that they're required to listen to. We have a video that we show them that they, that force them to watch so that they can actually see and get a visual of what we are and what we're doing and what we've done. And, like, you know, every year we update these, these videos, these audios, so that the person knows that, wow, like, like we're in Brazil, we're in Japan, we're in Russia, we're um, in Europe, you know, we're winning, like, you know, the UFC side, um, uh, MMA side, the judicial side, everything. So we put that we put that in place so that uh, we can slow, slow down that learning curve. Because if we did not have that in place, it would definitely be a different obstacle than someone who just traveled down for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you hear a lot of uh, I, I'm not going to say a lot, but let's just say a, a fair percentage of coaches don't want their students uh, going around to other gyms and stuff, cross training. Uh, is this something that you also uh, believe in? And is there a reason behind that? Or are you, uh, if people come to your school, are they allowed to wear their other team's patches if they're just doing drop-ins? This is what I'm wondering about uh, as far as the, the politics involved in jujitsu. Is it still there or not so much? Well, as far as the politics, I'm uh, I'm very open. I'm, I have a I have more of a Olympic training center type of style mentality. Like my school is open to anybody and everybody. A lot of people send me emails like, um, "Are students from other schools allowed to train at your school?" Like, like it sounds crazy to me, but I guess it's like that some places. Anybody and everybody. We have guys right now that are here from Australia training at my school. I mean, you come from anywhere in the world, you can come train with us. Uh, you can wear your patches. You I don't care if you're from Great Spot. I don't care where you're from. Come here if you want to train. Um, wear your patches. Uh, as far as us training and traveling and 
like guys going to other schools. My guys, like I said, my guys are in Atlanta. They want to go to Lions. So they wherever they wherever they're at, they're in New York. Want to stop by my son Garcia? Like, I have no problem. I don't say, oh, you can't go to his school. One thing, one thing we don't do, we don't have the situation where there's a bunch of rogue schools where the guys don't have any leader and there's no system in place where a bunch of guys are just randomly training together to try and get, you know, they don't, they don't have a structured system. They're not even part of a structured program. Like our guys, we have affiliate schools that we all train together. Uh, we have other teams that come in to bring their guys. Uh, we'll train together. Uh, some guys send their guys to our school. Um, we'll send our guys to other schools, you know, to train. Um, we have a very open-ended Olympic training center type uh, model, philosophy. I do not abide by the traditional uh, uh, standard where, you know, you can't train there, you can't do this, and if you come to my school, you got to take your gear off and wear our hats, like, stuff like that at all. How, how important do you think that uh, – do you think – I have a feeling, like, with that mindset and that, that uh, openness – I think your students, in fact, would end up being more loyal to you than ever. Uh, do you think that's important in jujitsu, and other people should uh, take that motto? Um, it, it depends. It's like the, the, most people out here are teaching or have a philosophy or a mindset based upon what they were raised on. So if you're raised in a culture where you can't wear, you know, people can't wear the um, patches on your floor, that's probably what you're going to continue with and if that's how if that's been the reality of your entire uh, martial arts career that's going to be the, you know the reality unless you, you change it it's going to be hard to change so like all my students know that it, there is a fine line like there's a lot of people that say oh i should be able to train anywhere but like if you if you have a blue belt or a, a, a regular purple belt that is is buying into this philosophy say oh i should be able to train anywhere like they don't even they don't even know the system at, at the school that they're at and they're they want to go train around other people and train other schools. You have, you have to find a school or a team to learn their system, to learn their style. I'm, I'm talking like guys like you know, my, 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 the Keenan, the DJ, the JT, like all my guys who have got the style, got the thing. They're, they're, they're part of the system. They know the system. At that point, I, like training with other per people is great, but it, it's a misconception when a person, when you have a blue belt that says, or there's, like I see on the forum, sometimes people say, well, they're the paying customer and they should be able to go where they want. Yeah, you can, but if you want to get good, you have to learn somebody's system. And if you can't, if, if you don't believe in the system that you're in, then you need to go find a system that you can believe in, learn that system, and then when you get really good, maybe then you can go play around with it. Because a lot of blue belts will go to another school and they'll see something else and say, oh, that, that, I didn't learn that yet. Well, it wasn't, even, it wasn't even your time to learn that yet. But they think they're getting that something being held back from them because everybody's system teaches things in their own order. Like our, like my order that we teach the basic beginners, uh, they may feel like they're getting held back in the very beginning if they went to another school that's showing all these fancy guards, these fancy sweeps. They're like, wow, I'm not learning that there. And, and all that stuff is, more, is cooler. But in two or three years, when you, you would have learned that anyway, but your basics and base was so solid then and only then would you appreciate it. So I mean, hold on, I'm not I'm making sense, but I, I have a very clear. You're making you're making actually it. perfect sense right now. Yeah. It's crazy. And and it's a bit since I have one guy like, well, why don't you go train here? Like, you're, listen, you've been training eighteen months. You know absolutely nothing. Like, I, I and it happens here all the time. One guy said, why don't you show us the uh, what's the uh, new thing? The Burma Bur 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 or whatever. Burma Billow. Yeah. Whatever the name of the like fancy new guard everyone's doing. Yeah, oh, yeah. He saw it on the YouTube, wanted to learn how to do it. I said, We don't do that here. We're not teaching any white belts that crap. We're not teaching no white belts that sweep. Because next thing you know, the white belt's trying to win in class, they say no, he's doing that, only doing that in class, not learning all the basics, not learning the basic system, not learning nothing that we're teaching, and then they say you know, he's sweeping everybody with that, so it's gonna be hard for him not to use it. But now he uses it twenty four months later when he gets to the classes that where everyone knows it already and knows all the defenses and knows how to deal with it, and now it's not working, and you get choked, you get your back taken. Now you're wondering what went wrong. What went wrong is in the last 18 months that you left my system to learn this other flashy stuff. Now you need my system to to succeed. Now you're two years in. And now you're probably gonna quit. That makes great sense. Yeah. So basically, for the people listening out there, find a system that you believe in. 
learn it first, and then worry about the fancy stuff. The basics still work, correct? Yeah, the basics still work, but it's, it's more on a system. You have to find a system and find somebody that, that, that you know, as a leader, because you, like, like you look at Alliance, you know, they have leaders. You have Bobby Grigel, you have Jacare, you have uh, 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 each team has clear-cut leaders. Then you, then you have a lot of these what I call splinter teams. So you have these splinter teams that usually when a team splinters off from a, a, a big team, then you'll, you'll always see them splinter again. Two or three yeah. or four teams. If you look at Alliance when they first split, like all the teams that split from Alliance, they all split again and again and again because there's no leader. Everyone's trying to vie for the, for the number one position, and it just keeps on splintering. You have to find someone that you believe in and believe in their, their core philosophy, their core systems, their core training, and, and, and there's a very fine line with this, you know, people bounce back and forth. A lot of people say, oh, well, you should train with everybody. Like, good to train with everybody. And that, I feel, is 100% correct in certain contexts. There's other situations where that is completely wrong. Like, if, if a guy is six months in, 12 months in, he's a blue belt, thinks he's good, and he's buying into that, go train with everybody, he'll never learn nothing. He'll just be like a rogue, and then he'll get to a point at a purple belt level or so that he just stagnates and he does nothing else. You see a lot of guys that are great blue belts, a phenomenal purple belt, uh, they do it really well at purple belt, and then a brown, you never hear of them again, and black belt, they can't do anything, and they're just popular, but they're not not doing anything, they're not winning anything. And, Absolutely. And there's, there's certain things and decisions that they made throughout their career, um, whether it was their white belt, blue belt, um, that are a direct result to the non-success at the higher levels, and they don't even know it. And so what do you, what do you say to, uh, to um, how do you, what would you distinguish between a gym owner and, and a leader? And how would you, what advice would you give that coach or that owner to, um, to instill this in their students? Um, you speak a lot about structure. I'm assuming it would have to do with that. But how do you keep a student from, let's say, uh, looking somewhere else? How do you, how do you keep them? Or, or show them that this will pay off in the long run, but now. Well, like, like at my school, I have a system that creates that. So uh, we, have these, we have these audio CD programs, and we have these video learning programs, we have these webinars that indoctrinate a, a new prospect into our school, into our system, into what we've done. So, like, in a, in a, like conceptually, I'll paint a picture for you. So, basically, you're a brand-new student, and you listen to all these audio CDs, you listen and watch all these videos of all these guys that we've, Turned the world champion, the blue belt world champion, purple belt world champion, brown belt world champion, guys that have grand slams in Brazil and uh, the Europeans, the Brazilian nationals, uh, the world champions, and then all these things, UFC champions, uh, UFC fighters, main event, Fox Channel News. So I paint this entire picture and then bring it back, bring it back down to the raw essence. The, 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 the commonalities between all these high-level people are that they all came into our system and follow our system 100%. Right. And if you want to have the same success or any type of success like these guys that have come before you, then I would highly recommend that you follow our system 100%. And then we go into a, 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 a talk about how these are the most common obstacles that you will experience through your training career. There are people that say that you should only do gi. I mean, sorry, only do no gi, and no gi is better, better than a gi. Well, here we believe that gi is the best, and if you look at it, and then we make our point and our case why gi is the best to refute anything that they're reading in books or reading in forums or hearing in interviews, then we, then we break down and say, talk about our system, the importance of our system, and our training philosophy, and, and why we train with each other, why we train within these systems, and, and you know, but basically I, I, we indoctrinate a new student into this mindset, and then it turns on. If they decide they want to go train the road, and, you know, we don't stop them. It's on them. But that has worked very well for us. But I think I think it's genius, personally. Yeah, absolutely. Last last thing, and then I'll let you go on with your day. You've been so generous talking with us. Uh, actually, two things. Sorry, uh, the super fight Diaz versus uh, Nick Diaz. That is versus Barulio Estima. Your call and how it's going to end. I don't know how. One thing, if you if you ever see 
or any of um, when people ask me about fights and MMA or grappling, I don't make predictions per se. Uh, I love Nick Diaz, the Diaz brothers, what they do as far as, you know, their, their loyalty to jiu-jitsu. The fact yeah. that he came back into the gear is going to get somebody like Raleo. You know, it's, it's um, amazing. I haven't seen Nick grapple and do jiu-jitsu since with the gi. Uh, Raleo is amazing. I, I, I was looking forward to a great fight. So, so you got Estima. No, I, I don't think it, I don't know. All right, we'll, we'll, we'll go with I don't know. We'll, we'll let that, it's a good answer. Okay. Uh, also, last thing, absolute last thing for you. Uh, can you can you name some people that you uh, really enjoy watching do jiu-jitsu? Uh, not your students, is that okay? No problem. My, my favorite person I like doing jiu-jitsu, man, is Ted A. No, Ted A is Jock Ray. Nice. Yeah, he's 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 high level. Yeah, it's, it's amazing, and yeah. a lot. I was able to be in Brazil at all the time, but you know he was the grand champion and winning everything, and and just the energy what he did for this dude, it, you know, just something special, very special. All right, perfect. That, that's a, a great answer. I, I agree. He's, he's one of the best. Uh, first of all, uh, let me just say thanks once again. Uh, everyone, uh, let me know what you guys thought of having uh, Lloyd Irvin on. So thank you. Thank you very much, Lloyd. Thank you, guys. All right. Enjoy the, the rest of your night. Good luck in the future. Right. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Take care. Take care. All right, guys. So uh, we just had Lloyd Irvin on. Uh, that was unbelievable, John. What did? What? How great? Uh, awesome. I mean, that's just not many chances like that. So it was, it, it was actually hard to, to sometimes talk because, like, I, I was in awe sometimes. Like, yeah. great answers. Yeah, you're listening to the answer so much, you forget about the next question. So. Yeah. <laughs> so everyone, uh, remember, this is brought to you by Submission Fight Company. Uh, they are giving some shirts away. Uh, it's a free giveaway. I did not mention it, but you guys, Lloyd Irvin talked about his favorite fighter uh, to watch. So if, if you just skim through the, the beginning, you're not going to know this answer. Last question. I don't want you to fast forward, though. Listen to the whole thing. He said his favorite fighter to watch, not one of his students. He named it. I want you guys to... Hit us up on Twitter at the BJJ Addict. That's T H E capital B J J and then capital A and the rest A D D I C T. That's the BJJ Addict. Tell me what he said. Or on Facebook. Or on no, go with the Twitter, not on the Facebook for this one. And we will pick three winners randomly. Uh, this is no inside jobs, and uh, you know. You get a free T-shirt from Submission Fight Company. Also, it's brought to us by uh, the MMA Mount. I want you to go to both their websites. Uh, go like them on Facebook. These are things we do for uh, the community, guys. Help each other. Support everything. Remember to look at our Facebook, YouTube, Twitter. I'm, I'm, I'm David, a.k.a. Real DWC. Follow me on Twitter. Uh, I'd like to thank John also. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank... Fight fans, radio, go like them also. They're putting this together, uh, you know, really helping out myself and uh, the BJJ addicts and, and supporting jujitsu. So this is our first ever episode. I'd like to say thanks to everyone. And uh, that is all I got to say, guys. Good night. Good night. Good night.